Okay, we are in our Understanding the Times study tonight and looking at a uh, new book, diff- not new written, but a uh, different book and perhaps a book you've never heard of. It's very popular, but uh, maybe not uh, known or read by you yet. It's called Jesus Calling. And here's what it looks like. One of the, well, up there you got it too, but here's, it's in different forms, uh, different uh, styles of the book, bigger, smaller, different exteriors, etc. But that's what the book is, and uh, that's what we'll be looking at this evening. We're going to look at the author. We're going to do it a little bit differently. Normally when we've looked at books, we've kind of focused on the content of the book. And that won't be so much the case uh, tonight. Um, I'm going to look at the background of the author a little bit, but as well the background to the book and where she got the book from. That's far more important, really, than what she wrote. And that's the danger, um, where she got the book from, more than what she actually wrote. So following along, number one, the background of the author. We're going to look at uh, who this is. Her name is Sarah Young. And she was born in 1946 and was not a Christian, was not brought up in a Christian home. Um, Before her conversion, she graduated from Wellesley College. How many have heard of Wellesley College? It's a women's women's only school, okay, very liberal. Um, She had a major in philosophy, that's where I'm at here, and... She quite likely was a student at the same time as Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton is a year younger, 1947 birth. And um, so if they both went there from high school, then Hillary would would have been the year after Sarah Young, maybe even the same year, four years that they were there together. But at least I include that just to point out that it's a liberal school, and that's where this Sarah Young went to. Again, this is before her salvation, so don't count this against her. She just was going there as an unsaved person. She heard about a place called Labrie Christian Fellowship. Um, how many of you have heard of that? Labrie. Francis Schaefer. Um, Labrie means the shelter in, in French. She went to Switzerland, where this one is. There's several. I think there's the only location at that time when she was there. But there are several locations around the world, including a two or three here in the United States of Labrie Fellowship. <clears throat> but she'd read Francis Schaeffer's book, Escape from Reason. Again, she's an unsaved lady at this time, graduate of Wellesley College, still relatively young, and uh, read that book, went to that fellowship. Um, while she was there, a counselor asked her, and she sat down together at dinner time or something, Asked her two questions. The first question was this, are you a Christian? And her answer was no, she was not. In the sense, I mean, she maybe understood something about it, but she was not a Christian. And the counsel also asked her another question. What can you not forgive yourself for? And to be honest, I'm not a fan of that question of that idea of forgiving yourself. There's nowhere in the Bible which talks about forgiving yourself. You forgive others, you seek forgiveness from God, you seek forgiveness from others. The Bible never speaks of <clears throat> forgiving yourself or trying to forgive yourself, having to forgive yourself. So I'm not sure the basis of that question, but that's the question really more so than the are you a Christian question that got her to thinking about her spiritual life. And uh, let her see her testimony in a sentence Uh, When I was alone, I asked Jesus to forgive all my sins and be my Savior, God. And that took place in 1973, and she was 27, 26 years old at that time. So that's when uh, her conversion, that's far different than we saw other people before, you know, the shack guy, they don't have a clear testimony. Uh, She does. She asked Jesus to forgive her sins and to be her Savior, God, her Savior and Lord. Okay, um, but it's also there, while she's there at Labrie, that things start to change in other ways. Uh, she's walking outside, and it's apparently a beautiful location, but here's what she said, or what she wrote in her 
book, I suddenly became aware of a lovely presence with me. And my involuntary response was to whisper, sweet Jesus. Okay, so this is um, where things kind of start to change with her in terms of, um, at, at least as far as she's describing it, a lovely presence. <clears throat> Page two. Is this clear enough? Can anybody see that well enough? Likewise? Okay. In this book, the word presence is always capitalized. It's almost like the word presence is another name for God, another word for God. Um, you know, grammatically, you, just can't, you don't capitalize the word presence. You don't capitalize any words unless it's referring to a uh, proper noun. Um, but she always capitalizes that word in this book as if it's has more significance and meaning. And the title of the book, subtitle, Jesus Calling, Enjoying Peace in His Presence. And uh, again, presence is constantly, always, capitalized in the book. And that's significant in her writings. She and her husband served as missionaries in Japan and in Australia. Um, served at least two terms, two four-year terms in Japan. Uh, ministered in Australia as well. Um, last I knew they were living in the States. Again, she's 70, 71 years old, <clears throat> and perhaps has retired from missionary work, but um, has served as missionaries in Japan, Australia. She's earned degrees. Besides the degree at Wellesley College, as a believer, she uh, earned a master's degree in counseling and biblical studies from Covenant Theological Seminary. She's uh, a Reformed background at this point, you know, as a believer now. Um, she is conservative in her theology. She's not a liberal. She's not sharing a lot of lies we used to believe about God type stuff. Uh, she's conservative in her theology and her doctrinal statement. And she also has a degree in counseling from a, a secular university, Georgia State University. And she's authored a bunch of books, I think 12, I believe, and then several, like Jesus Calling, she's written Jesus Calling for Kids, she's calling, you know, different uh, forms of this particular book, and translating different languages, all that. Every book except one has the name Jesus in the title. Uh, Jesus Calling, uh, this other one here, Jesus Today, uh, Jesus Lives. Um, all the books except for one, and the one that doesn't is a uh, kind of a paraphrased version, a Reader's Digest type version of Jesus Calling. I forgot the name of it, uh, but it's Jesus Calling in a condensed form, and it doesn't have the word Jesus in its title. Um, her books have sold over 20 million copies. Now, the total of the 12 different books combined have sold over 20 million copies. Uh, but by far, Jesus Calling is the most well-known and popular book. Um, it was published in the year 2004, and it has sold over 17 million copies. And it has appeared on all the major bestseller lists. That phrase comes from some of the uh, advertisements for the book and including the New York Times. And like I said before, for Christian books on the New York Times bestseller list, uh, be careful, because that probably means there's something wrong with the book. New York Times is not exactly known for its uh, kindness and understanding of the Christian thoughts. Okay. Um, this next slide isn't in your paper, um, but it's some endorsements of the book, and this is just a list. This is on, most of these are on the website, JesusCalling.com, I think. And if you want this, I can print this off, but this is, you can just find this on the Jesus Calling website. I just put some of the names that are either familiar or interesting. Uh, Max Lucado, you probably have heard of him, um, very popular writer. But look what he says. It would be hard to overstate the impact of the writings of Sarah Young. She is a stream in the desert. Her words quench our thirst. Um, that should be the Lord doing that and the Bible doing that, not uh, some other books. Reba McIntyre, I'm not sure um, 
if she's a believer or not, but uh, she says, I love the book, Jesus Calling. Um, she says many friends have given it to her over the years. She has the app on her phone. And the last phrase, it always knows what I'm needing each day. Well, a book is an inanimate object. Um, but people talk emotionally about things when they don't need to. But it always knows what I'm needing each day. This next I never heard of, but the significance of him, and I didn't quote all these, what they said about it, but he's a Jesuit priest. This isn't a Bible-believing Christian or a, anybody. He's a Jesuit priest who uh, likes the book Jesus Calling. Melinda Gates, I never heard anything about her being a believer at all. Uh, she's Bill Gates' wife, so the another billionaire in this case. I have a profound faith. Well... Um, faith in what? You'd ask her. I like Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. You live your life wide open with gratitude. Well, <laughs> okay, if you're a billionaire, you could do that. Um, Kathy Lee Gifford, I didn't quote her, but she's a well known uh, um, television personality. Robert Morris, he's a pastor of a church in Dallas, Texas. Jesus Calling is this generation's my utmost for its highest. When you read it, you'll be drawn closer to God and to his word. You may recall that uh, the guy who wrote the message um, endorsed the shack and the, uh, by saying this generation's pilgrim's progress. So they're trying to legitimize some things that don't need to be and shouldn't be. Sean Lowe, this should be, I have no idea who this guy is. Um, <laughs> But based on his television appearances, I would not count him as a uh, guy who you'd seek and to endorse a Christian book and find get Christian advice from. He appeared on The Bachelorette as a contestant and then as The Bachelor on a later episode of that. Uh, but he's endorsing this book. Rick Warren's son, Josh, endorses the book, for what that's worth. And Priscilla Shire, um, she's an actress. Her dad is Tony Evans. He's a well-known pastor in Dallas, Texas. Um, she appeared in the movie The War Room and has written some stuff as well. I'm not sure if she's talking about this book or not. She doesn't name the book, but it, it sounds like it. She said, a friend sent me a book on silent prayer. The book explains how purposeful periods of silent prayer can help believers hear God's voice. As my heart burned within me, I knew that the Lord was calling me to experience him in prayer in a brand new way. Now, she might not be talking about Jesus calling, but what she says here is essentially the background to Jesus calling. What she describes here is how um, Sarah Young got the book, Jesus Calling. A period of silent prayer, hearing God's voice. And uh, we're going to look at that in a few moments. But anyways, those are some of the well-known and different individuals who've endorsed the book, Jesus Calling. Okay. Um, let's look at the background to the writing of this book. This is the most important part um, of the book. It's not so much what's found on page 55 or 130, but what she says in the background, in the introduction to the book, excuse me, the preface, how she claims she got the book is what's important to be warned from. In order to understand the book Jesus Calling, we need to understand the book called God Calling. If you remember on the first screen, the black, well, um, they all had black for a while, but the one that had the three pictures, um, it had this book as well, God Calling. And the reason we're talking about this, is, it's not just because it has a similar name, but because this book, Jesus Calling, is based, she got the idea for this from reading this and realizing how these people got their book. Let's look at what that is. Okay, God Calling was first published in 1932. Jesus Calling is the year 2004, so it's contemporary, but God Calling was 1932. It's edited by a man named A.J. Russell, who is a uh, theologian of some sort. Um, and he says it was written by, quote-unquote, two listeners, two 
listeners. Um, they are not named. They are both female, but they're anonymous. Um, I don't know if they didn't want to be identified, or, and if not, for whatever reason. Um, but they just call themselves the two listeners. In the book itself, A.J. Russell, the editor of the book, titles the preface, The Two Listeners, starting on page three. And then there's a second introduction written by, it's called by one of the two listeners, and her little paragraph or chapter here is called The Voice Divine. And we'll quote that apart from that in a couple of moments. But these two women claim that their message was given to them by the living Christ himself. That is uh, in the introduction by the man named Russell, A.J. Russell. Um, the book cover, the inside book cover, right in here, it's on the inside flap. I'll just read the whole little paragraph, two or three sentences. It says, not one person, but two, both women, wrote this book. They elected to remain anonymous and to be called two listeners. Their claim was that their message had been given to them by the living Christ himself. My simple task has been to prepare God calling for publication. And he says something similar to that in here. Um, I'll just read these couple of sentences on the inside part. The claim which they make is an astonishing one, that their message has been given to them today here in England by the living Christ himself. Having read their book, I believe them. Okay, so here's a theologian. He seems to be a liberal from what I've I found a couple books otherwise that he's written. Um, but he believes that they got this from the living Christ himself, that Jesus revealed this, inspired almost, uh, like, like the Apostle Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's very similar to what these women are claiming for themselves, in which A.J. Russell says, I believe. A Sarah Young, let her see, followed that same approach in Jesus' calling. She followed the same approach. <clears throat> and not only Jesus' calling, but her other books, at least um, the ones that are the devotional in nature. Jesus Today, uh, for example, she used the same approach that the God calling listeners used. Here's a quote from, from this little book, page number 12. Or, Roman numerals 12 is the introduction. I decided to listen with pen in hand, writing down whatever I heard in my mind. Listening. And whatever I heard, I wrote down. Whatever I heard in my mind. That's what she's saying where she gets this book from. Okay, here's... Um, and this is, I mentioned, The Voice Divide. This is kind of the second introduction written by one of the two listeners, one of those two ladies. Here's what she said. From the first, beautiful message was, messages were given to her, and the her is the other, the two listeners. So that the one says, I didn't get anything for a while, but my friend did. So from the first, beautiful messages were given to her by our Lord himself. And every day from then, from then on, these messages have never failed us. We felt all unworthy and overwhelmed by the wonder of it and could hardly realize that we, italicized, were being taught, trained, and encouraged day by day by him personally when millions of souls far worthier had to be content with guidance from the Bible, sermons, their churches, books, and other sources. So um, they are on a higher plane than we are, they're claiming. We've got to be content. The rest of us poor souls had to be content with the Bible. They're getting messages from God and Jesus Christ himself. She also added this. So to us, this book, which we believe has been guided by our Lord himself, is no ordinary book. It is published after much prayer to prove that a living Christ speaks today. Um, she's claiming this book, God Calling, is not an ordinary book. Now, if it's not an ordinary book, it has to have a different source than other ordinary books do. It's not just an individual or two individuals writing down. They are being, they're basically claiming inspiration by the Lord, revealing this book to them. That's the essence of what this is. Now, it's not an ordinary book. 
And then on March 13th, I didn't read that whole book. I just kind of skimmed a little bit. But on March 13th, spirit, spiritualism is wrong. No man should ever be a medium for any spirit other than mine, other than the spirit of Jesus. So be a medium. A medium is like channeling a demon, a dead person, etc. Um, no man should ever be a medium for any spirit except the spirit of Jesus. Okay, um, so it's, what does this tell you about this God calling book anyways? What's that? Yeah, they're mediums. Um, it's okay to be a medium if the spirit is Jesus' spirit, but uh, they're mediums. What's the Bible say to do with mediums? The Old Testament. Canon of Scripture is closed. Canon of Scripture is closed. Exactly right. They're going. Well, um, and she is a graduate of a Reformed School, Covenant Theological Seminary and is reformed in her theology. If you were to look at her, doc and her doctoral statement is good, and what she says about the Bible is good. How she practices is uh, the issue here. Okay, letter D. In addition to listening to God, and that's what we just looked at, um, and this is going back to Sarah Young, getting back to the Jesus Calling book, she also practices visualization. So what is visualization? <clears throat> it's, what's that? Yeah, it's new age. Um, seeing things, perceiving things. Here's what she said, the quotation. Again, this is from the, the introduction to the book. And that's why the content of the book won't be offensive, really. But the introduction, where she gets this, that's the danger. Our combined ministries, and she's talking about... <clears throat> when she was in a, as a missionary, subjected our family to intense spiritual warfare, and I prayed for protection every morning. One morning as I prayed, I visualized God protecting each of us. So she's seeing something. And as you see the rest of the quote, um, you'll find what she's seeing, at least in her mind. I pictured first our daughter, then our son, and then Steve, her husband, encircled by God's protective presence. Again, the word presence capitalized. How you see God's protective presence, what did that look like? I have no idea. Then she said this, when I prayed for myself, I was suddenly enveloped in brilliant light and profound peace. So she is in a you know, spiritual warfare, whatever that involves with her. In Japan, I could see that with the... Um, the animism and other false religions over there. But she's visualized. She's seeing God protecting my husband, my child, my children. And then when I prayed for myself, a brilliant light, she says, surrounds her. And she has profound peace. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to this other slide. I, I'm sorry this is out of, out of order. She had an interview with CBN. If you're familiar with CBN, that's uh, Pat Robertson's network. Um, my journey began with a devotional book called God Calling, and that's her. That's not me adding it, you know, guessing. That's, this was included in the interview. Written in the 1930s by two women who practiced waiting in God's presence. Again, she capitalizes presence in this even. Writing the messages they received as they listened. About a year after I started reading this book, I began to wonder if I too could receive messages during my times of communing with God. So I decided to listen to God with pen in hand, writing down whatever I sensed he was saying. Of course, I wasn't listening for an audible voice. I was seeking the still, small voice of God in my mind and heart. Um, so she's distancing herself somewhat, not listening for a voice, waiting to hear a voice, but God is going to speak to her. God is going to reveal things to her. God is going to teach her. Um, she's going to listen to God, still small voice. She actually included this type of a message in the earlier versions of a Jesus Calling book, but they deleted it. People were complaining. They were upset by that, you know, and obviously so. Uh, the 
Thomas Nelson, who publishes it, said that it created some confusion. That's why they took it out. But uh, it's teaching extra biblical, like you mentioned, extra biblical revelation. I'm getting something from God directly that nobody else can get. He's going to talk to me. He's going to reveal things to me. Um, Barry, that was not in her book, although it used to be, as it says on there. But this is an interview that she had with the, uh, I don't know if it was on, online or on TV or radio, but, but with CBN. Okay. I also found another interview on something called Bible Gateway. Um, and Bible Gateway is a much more conservative and mainstream, not a charismatic group. And she, she's much more conservative mainstream when she talked to them. She's kind of plays her audience, unfortunately. And that's not a good thing. Okay, um, letter E. Much of the book's content is fine. You, you read through it and you say, that's a good devotion. I can learn from that. But again, the problem is the method of receiving the messages. It's troubling, but it's unbiblical. She is claiming special revelation from God without using those words, but that's what she's claiming. Um, I'm just going to random, I'm just going to read one of these. I'll st somebody give me a date, month and day. Okay, good. What's today? <laughs> July, August 27th. August 27th. I'll just read it. And uh, again, well, it says me. The me is Jesus. Okay, it's not Sarah Young. It's not me. She writes this as if Jesus is talking to us. Spend time with me for the pure pleasure of being in my company. I can brighten up the dullest of gray days. I can add sparkle to the routines of daily life. You have to repeat so many tasks day after day. This monotony can dull your thinking until your mind slips into neutral. A mind that is unfocused is vul vulnerable. <laughs> this is interesting. A mind that is unfocused is vulnerable to the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's exactly where she's getting this book. She's opening up my mind, whatever comes in. I'm going to write it down. Um, all of which exert a downward pull on your thoughts. As your thinking processes deteriorate, you become increasingly confused and directionless. The best remedy is to refocus your mind on, and heart on me, your constant companion. Even the most confusing day opens up before you as you go step by step with me. My presence goes with you wherever you go, providing light for your path. And then she has a couple verses, uh, just the text, Psalm 63, 7 and 8, and Psalm 119, 105. That word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path verse. Um, yeah, that's an interesting statement there. Uh, mind unfocused, vulnerable to the world, the flesh, and the devil. She's going to admit that in a little bit. Okay, page four. The danger of Jesus calling. I mean, we're reading a book, looking at a book written by an experienced missionary, conservative theology, Reformed theology. Um, a person who realized, you know, I'm, I'm lost. I asked Jesus to be my savior. You know, look at all that. Look at that part of a background. Say, well, this this should be a good book. This, this sounds great. I'm going to read this book. Then you look at, and all you had to do is read the introduction, especially from the earlier version. But even most of the quotes I had up there were from the current introduction. Um, where she tells us where she got this, not the God calling part, but the, the essence of it. Her listening practice, letter A, is called contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer. Now, she might deny that. She's just listening to God. But what that listening to God is called is contemplative prayer. I hope I got a slide here. Okay. This is also on the, C, the same interview. And she describes how she listens and then how she wrote the book, Jesus Calling. Before I begin, I pray for protection of my mind from distractions, distortions, and deception. I ask that I will hear only the voice of Jesus, yet every single word he wants me to hear. 
Then I simply pray, help me, Holy Spirit, and I listen. Eventually, I hear a phrase or a sentence, and I write it down. As I listen and write, I continue asking for the Holy Spirit's help. I also thank Jesus for the message as I receive it from him. I may take short breaks in listening to read what I've already written. I try to relax and enjoy Jesus' presence, not becoming overly focused on writing. Scripture often comes to mind, and I write that in whatever version I remember it. And she, the NIV is her main version in the uh, introduction. She has five other verse, versions that she uses. Um, but she describes this practice of listening, and this is in the book. My prayer times change from monologue to dialogue. Prayer um, is not just to her talking with God. You know, when we have devotions, you know, it's we we dialogue. We hear from God by reading the Bible, not by sitting there, you know, Lord, teach me something, tell me something, expecting to hear some, something, some sentence, um, phrase or sentence from God. That's, that's not studying the scriptures. That's not learning from the word of God. That's getting some new revelation from God, contemplative prayer. What's prayer in the Bible? Prayer in the Bible, it'll be, is described as communication from man to God. When you pray, you talk to God. That's what prayer is. Amen. Contemplative prayer reverses that. God communicates to man. We sit there, we wait, we listen, and then write down whatever we hear. God communicates to me. Um... That's not prayer, God communicating to us. God spoke to us in the Word. And look at a few verses, and this is basic. I'm not going to learn anything necessarily, except hopefully we'll be reminded uh, simply on what prayer is. Prayer is not God talking to me. Prayer is us talking to God. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. This is the very first Bible verse I memorized. It's, or I recall ever memorizing as a little boy in vacation Bible school. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. We are told to call upon the Lord. That's praying. Call upon God. Speak to him. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Matthew 7, 7. Jesus described prayers are seeking help from him. Not sitting there waiting to hear from God, but talking to him, saying, I need your help, seeking the Lord. The next verse, Luke 11, verses 1 and 2. says this, it came to pass that as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So what did the Lord do? They asked the question, Lord, teach us to pray. Here's the Lord's answer. He said unto them, when you pray, say, not just sit there hoping to get something from God, but say, and then the Lord's prayer, our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. When God, when, when Jesus was answering the question or the request, teach us to pray, he said, talk to me. Talk to your Father in heaven. Say, speak to him. Not sit down, clear your mind, focus your mind, and wait to hear from God. That's not prayer. And that's not biblical. And then James chapter 5. Verses 16 through 18, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed, per, prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Elijah prayed. 
He didn't wait for the rain to start and stop. He didn't sit there expecting God to do something, give him some message. He prayed. He talked to God. And God answered. That is prayer. Prayer is talking to God. Sarah Young and the two listeners, and A.J. Russell and others, um, Priscilla Shire that we read earlier, so I'm going to sit down and wait for God to talk to me. Contemplative prayer. Prayer is never described as that. Anybody want to guess what the contemplative prayer, what their favorite Bible verse is? That's a good one. Um, exactly. Psalm 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Just sit down. That the way they describe it. Sit down, sit still, and wait for me to talk to you. Um, that's not what that verse says. Be still and know. Not be still and wait to hear from me. Just settle down. I'm God. I'm, in, I'm fine. Don't panic. You read that whole psalm, Psalm 46. It talks about even though the world's falling apart, God's in control. That's what the essence of the meaning of the psalm is. Not be still and wait to hear from God. But that's their key verse. Okay, letter C. There's an inherent danger in listening. An inherent danger in listening. And the danger is this. It might not be Jesus who speaks. How do you know it's Jesus? You know his voice? <laughs> um, how do you know it's Jesus talking to you instead of something else or somebody else? Even Sarah Young acknowledges that there's a danger in what she does. Page, did everybody get that? <laughs> Who was that? Okay. Did everybody get page four done? Sarah Young acknowledges that there's a danger in what she does? Yes. Okay, page five. Again, yeah, this is from the CBN interview. And this is where a doctoral statement sounds good. Always subordinate your personal listening to absolute biblical truth. Always subordinate your personal listening to absolute biblical truth. When you're listening to God or for God, make sure it's truth. If something you hear is inconsistent with biblical teaching, don't write it down. It's not from God. So she's acknowledging by that statement that when you open up your mind and just sit there waiting to hear, that you might not hear from God. You're going to hear something. Um, if something you hear, something comes into your mind, or something somebody talks to you, but it's not consistent with the Bible, then that's not from God. So then you've got to think, well, where did it come from? What's the source of that? And I think she told us on August 27th in her daily devotion for today. Let me read that a little bit again. A mind that is unfocused is vulnerable to the world. By the way, um, how easy is it to keep your mind focused for moments and moments and hours if you're sitting there waiting to hear from God? And she doesn't tell us. I've never read how long she does this, if it's 10 minutes or two hours, I have no idea. Um, maybe she says it someplace. That's hard. It's hard to pray, keep praying for five minutes or 10 or 20 minutes or whatever, much less to be sitting there waiting to hear from somebody else. Your mind's going to become unfocused. Anyways, a mind that is unfocused is vulnerable to the world, the flesh, and the devil, all of which exert a downward pull in your thoughts. So if you hear something while you're sitting there waiting to hear from God and it's not biblical, what's the source? Probably not the world, because the world doesn't have access to you maybe at that point, but it's either your flesh or it's the devil. It's not, she acknowledges you can hear something while you're listening for God that doesn't come from God. She acknowledges that. There's a danger in what she does. Just don't write it down, she says. Well, that's... That doesn't make sense. It's in your mind. You just open up your mind to hear from somebody who's not God. And you're, you're safe if you don't write it down. It's, it's going to leave your mind if you don't write it down. 
No, it's stuck there. A few more verses responding to, uh, to this. 2 Timothy 4, verse 4. <clears throat> says this, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Ears shall turn to fables. People will, even if they claim like this, uh, I want to hear the truth, I want to hear from God, I want to listen for God. But they hear something else, they hear something that sounds good, sounds pleasant. It's not true, but it sounds good. I'm going to cling to that for today. You know it's a fable, false. Second Corinthians eleven verse four. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You might accept them instead of me. Paul. Another spirit. The word another there in the Greek is very clear. The word another there means another of a different kind. You open up your ears to whatever, your mind, and you hear something that sounds wonderful, the itching ears thing of 2 Timothy 4, you accept that. You've, you've turned to fables. You sit there and, again, those words from her own mouth, it's not from God. That's an important phrase, an important confession that she makes. Another spirit of a different kind. Um, what's wrong with it? I, I, Paul himself says you might well bear with it. You might accept that. Somebody preached a false gospel, somebody preaches another Jesus, another of a different kind, same word. You receive another spirit. You say, well, fine, it makes me feel good. I like that. I like the message from that person. You can go back to those endorsers, Bill or Melinda Gates, um, Priscilla Shire, um, Rick Warren's son. Yeah, these aren't, and that, that should tell you, you know, you learn a lot by who your friends are as well as who your enemies are. And the, the people who like this book, you know, if it's, that's why New York Times bestsellers is not an impressive thing. Um, people who like this book are not faithful, godly. I mean, it's probably some. I don't mean none of them are, but a lot of people that aren't Christians, they, they aren't uh, solid believers, they're people of the world, and yet they get some good feelings from this book. Um, why not read your Bible instead of reading a devotional that you don't know what the source is. And in fact, the lady herself doesn't know the source of this, this stuff. Because this next passage, Acts 16, um, to me, this is a very telling passage on this type of a type of a approach to claiming revelation from God. Acts 16, verses 16 through 18. It came to pass. As we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by sooth, saying, The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Is that a true statement? Yes. Definitely true. These men, Paul and Silas, servants of the Most High God, they show unto us the way of salvation. But who's saying it? Not the damsel, but who's the background to this? The spirit, some d demon. Verse 18, this she did for many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, not to the lady, not to the damsel, to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So there was a demon inside this woman. And the woman wasn't cursing God or cursing Jesus Christ. She was verbally acknowledging what was true and stating something that was true. But the source of that was not the Bible, it was not God, or some demon that had to be cast out of this woman. Even a good message is to be rejected. 
Paul did not say, well, thank you for that endorsement. Paul said, get out of her, you demon. Even a good message is to be rejected if it comes by means of an unbiblical method. Sarah Young has a good doctoral statement on the scriptures. Um, most of the interviews, maybe all of the interviews, as well as her website, she claims, like we saw at the top there, absolute biblical truth. That's her doctoral position. That's her paperwork. But a practice of listening opens her up to evil influences. The fact that what she says in the book is good, unoffensive, pleasant, helpful, doesn't mean it comes from God. And when you got somebody who's sitting there waiting to hear from God in her mind, whatever that all means, um, and writing down whatever comes into her mind, she admits it's dangerous. What about visualization? That was all contemplative prayer. Visualization is the antithesis of the Christian life. We're never told to visualize things. I think they base this in part on was it Elisha? They had these army of angels surrounding them to protecting Elisha and this uh, young man. And the young man, could, Elisha could see the angel out there. The other guy couldn't. And God, Elisha prayed, Lord, Lord, open up his eyes so he can see the angels out there. And God did. And the man was able to see them. That's kind of what they base this visualization on in the Christian life. What's the Bible say? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't need to see, we don't need to visualize things. God told us not to walk by sight. And in Galatians 2, verse 20, remember what uh, Sarah Young said, why, uh, at least the illustration she gave, what was going on when she visualized this brilliant light surrounding her and God's protective presence around her children and husband, spiritual warfare, danger, spiritual danger of some sort. About the Apostle Paul, Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He's not talking about saved by faith, it's talking about living by faith. Even with all the dangers that Paul faced, probably far more than Syria, not to minimize what she was going through in the family. But the Apostle Paul, you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and he tells it, he gives a whole list of things that he went through. He didn't say, God, give me some visualization of you protecting me. He just trusted the Lord. He walked and lived by faith. And that's what we are called to do, not walking by sight through visualization, but walking by faith, period. Okay, last page. Some concluding thoughts on the book, Jesus Calling, and the background to the book, the source of the book, contemplative prayer, and on visualization, which she also endorses and claims to do. Letter A, the Bible is God's word to us. The Bible is written down, the book you have in your lap. God's last letter to us, the book of Revelation, he tells us to hear the words of this prophecy. It says there's a blessing if you hear the words of this prophecy. Not if you hear from me 2,000 years later, but if you hear the words of this prophecy, there's a blessing there. God's word is enough. We don't need anything else. And that's not to say that devotional books are in and of themselves. If she would have written this book without having the visualization, the contemplative prayer, sitting down waiting for God, you know, it might not be a bad book. But when she tells us that she got this by that method, she just makes the book, throw it away, get rid of it. It's dangerous. You don't know the source. It's not the result of studying the Bible. It's the result of sitting down listening for God to talk to her. And study the Bible, yes. Wait to hear from God, no. But that's let it be. We are to use our mind to search the scriptures. 
This is Acts 17.11, kind of the key verse to our understanding the time study, studies. These are no, more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They received the word, not sitting down waiting for God to speak to them, but they received, they accepted it. They heard what Paul had preached. They accepted it, and they searched the scriptures to make sure it's true. Use your mind to search the scriptures, not open your mind to listen for some new message from God. God isn't giving new messages. He's spoken once in the last days. Letter C, Joshua 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. This book of the law, keep that, meditate upon that. Let us see, we are to meditate on what has been revealed. Well, God has already revealed. Joshua didn't have much of the Bible. At the most, he had five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Maybe didn't have even much of that available in his hands. But... That's what God told him. You just meditate upon what I've already revealed. Don't wait for something new. And there's more revelation to come. When Joshua was still alive, God was still revealing the scriptures, still inspiring men to write the scriptures. But God said, just meditate on what's been revealed. Psalm 1, verse 1 and 2 says the same, uh, same thing. To meditate upon the word of God. And lastly, letter D. And we studied this in Second Peter you know, a few months ago now. But even an audible message from God is not as sure as the written word. You know, uh, Sarah Young never claimed to hear audibly. She just said she hears it in her mind. But even if it was God himself talking, Peter says that. We heard the voice from heaven. Verse 18 of Second Peter 1. This voice which came down from heaven, we heard when we were with him, Jesus, and the Holy Mount. We actually heard the voice of God, Peter says. But then he says this, we have a more sure word of prophecy. And he goes on to describe that as being the word of God. It's not the more sure word of prophecy, what I heard audibly. The more sure word of prophecy, not what I heard in my mind as I sit down. The more sure word of prophecy is the inspired and written word of God. So that's what we need, and that's all we need. Study, read, meditate upon what I've been revealed to us, not hoping for, wishing for, expecting God to speak personally to your mind as you sit down. <clears throat> okay, any questions, comments anybody else has? Um, well, I, the risen Christ is a liberal, I mean, you can say it's a biblical term as well, I'm sure, but but as a liberal view of Jesus Christ. Um, but they don't believe he rose. So right. That's, that's, well, it's a spiritual presence of Christ, um, somewhat similar to this in a, in a way. Um, it's not the physical presence of Christ, physical resurrection, but... He's risen, he's with us, the Spirit of Christ is present with us, that sort of thing. Um, probably neo Orthodox. I'm not sure about neo evangelicals, but neo Orthodox, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Questions, comments? Debbie? Mm -hmm. talk to him. You know, or talk to 
him about anything. And um, sometimes, you know, I'll just be not thinking about much and then uh, a word from the scriptures, you know, something that I've read earlier, something that I know about. It's like it comes to my mind. But I really think, you know, that's biblical. It's mm-hmm. not that I'm sitting around just waiting right. for something to happen. So I don't know. I don't know how to explain that except I don't, I don't write it down. You know? it's well, that that's that's right. That's what we should be doing. Praying to God, talking to God. Where'd that come from? That word that came in that's I mean you've already studied this good, you've read those verses. So you're not hearing something new from God. Sarah Young describes new messages from God that she's receiving. Not Bible verses being brought back into her mind. I mean she did mention somewhere that she sometimes uh thinks of a verse and to the version that she remembers it in, whatever. But that's not her, that's not what this Jesus Calling book is. Um, that's not what's important to her. I shouldn't say that. That's, that's not what she does. She's not waiting to hear, thinking about what's already been revealed. She wants some new revelation from God. Right. Um, you know, we're led by the Spirit. There, there's a sense of, of uh, where the Lord leads us and guides us. We pray for that. We seek it. He, he helps us. He, he told us He'd do that. Right. Right. Yeah. And this, uh, again, does the Lord lead us? Yes. Does the Lord give us new messages, new revelations? No. Um, should we expect God to lead us? Yes. Should we expect God to give us some new truth? No. Um, he uses his word. That's how he leads us. Right. Meditate on the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Study the scriptures. It has to be. Teaching me. Instructing me tonight. This is one woman I'm going to stay away from and her writings. Mm-hmm. I have known for a long time that Jesus is coming soon. I love to sing about him. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell him I can hardly wait. But this lady, with her 20 million books, is doing, the, is doing Satan's job and getting paid for it. If you go to Sam's Club, you said you're going to stay away from this book. Good luck. You said you're going to stay away from this book. Uh, good luck in doing that because it's all over the place. Um, Sam's Club has a big display of not only this one book but all of her, several of her writings. Um, I'm sure Costco probably does or has anyways. Um, she's well, very Sam's popular. Club. Yeah. I didn't know that they were a Christian organization. They aren't. Well, they aren't, but this book here, Jesus Today, this is the 2013 Christian Book of the Year. Um, so it's not only, you know, I, I criticize New York Times bestseller list, but it's not 20 million pagans buying this. It's Christians and pagans, but, yeah. Um, that the Christian Book of the Year, I forgot the name of the organization it says in there. Well, it's tiny print. Um, but you read what books win that, and it's not solid theological books. It's uh, stuff like this. And that's what's popular. It's like the music of the world is popular in churches, the literature of the world. Uh, it's what Paul said, itching ears. That's what the world will want. That's what the world is getting. And the writers, even the Christian writer, Christian writers, Mm-hmm. Not just people shooting each other. They do that all the time. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. The Bible doesn't talk so much about crime as a sign of the last days. It talks about other areas of morals and response to the Word of God and opposition to Christians and things to that effect. And deception. 
and stuff that we're seeing. I mean, the news doesn't report that. The news reports the shootings and the bombings and stuff. Um, the Bible says men will be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasures, stuff like that. That's evidences, last times. Paul? Oh, definitely. Um, the local Christian bookstore is closed, actually. We don't have one anymore. Yeah. Um, it closed several months ago now, but um, it was almost worthless anyway. What was that? I said after the minimum wage went up. Okay. I don't know the reason, but yeah, that makes sense. Um, but it was basically a worthless bookstore anyways. You couldn't find anything good, solid in there. Right. You could order it. You can order it through Amazon too, probably cheaper. Yeah, right. Yeah. Christian bookstore highly endorsed the shack. Right, exactly. And I read it and was like, uh uh. Mm -hmm. Not even think about seeing that movie. Yeah. Yep. Um, things are popular that shouldn't be among Christians. I mean for the world to buy stuff like this and the shack and whatever makes sense. It, but for Christians to support and not just the words of the book, but the the background to the book, the method of I getting the book. Right. Yep. Which is interesting. She makes the same statement in this. Remember, uh, yeah. if it doesn't uh, always subordinate your personal listening to absolute biblical truth, um, and that's her doctrinal statement. But that's not her practice. And that's, she doesn't do that. Confessionally, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I can think of one church group in particular that has a reasonably sound statement of faith, allowing for the fact they're not Baptist. Mm -hmm. But those, those folks are completely out of touch. Completely out of touch. Um. Anything else? Anybody else? Terry. Uh, well, it sounds like what you're saying is actually in her book, there's, you know, it's doctrinally sound in a lot of places, although she's using the name of God in the person, which is putting words in God's mouth. But right. Right. And having whatever spirit fill our minds with whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, also, also the visualization is like we're trying to create our own reality by visualizing, you know, something and trying to make force that thing to be true. So it's like creating our own reality. But I thought on page three, a really big red flag should have gone up in her mind when she was surrounded by that brilliant light. Um, because that's none other than Satan. Yeah. Yes. Uh, right. Exactly. Good yeah. point. Yep. And uh, read what she said about that. It's not from God. Um, why expose yourself like that if you know that you're opening up your mind to? I mean, maybe she thinks she's better, and it's not going to affect her. But that's 
but he thinks he stands think he lets he fall and to say that you know you guys out there be careful what the context of that uh, statement she was asked the question by the CBN interviewer how would you recommend or guide somebody else to do this to listen and all that and that's her response um, and I think it's more than I just took that part out of the answer but uh, she knows, at least she, she states, you, know, you don't know where the source of this stuff is from. It's not from God. She admits that. Um, what else is it? Angel of light. That's right. Star of the morning. Or, Right. Very good point. I mean, absolute biblical truth. Well, if you got a, and she didn't, she wasn't addressing this to theologians, to uh, PhDs or whatever. She's just answering a question broadly. And you got, you know, 20 million people buying the book. So you're, you got whatever level of Christianity, you know, that individual, a newborn Christian, a Christian has been saved 10 years or people who's been saved 50 years. She's addressing all of them. And so you're right. How many of those will know what absolute biblical truth is? They're so settled in their faith that they'll be able to reject it completely. In the last days, Matthew 24 and elsewhere talks about be careful, but you're going to be deceived. And that's, um, that's what's taking place. And she's telling people to want to open up your minds and just try not to be deceived. And they're not going to be strong enough, many of them, most of them probably. Paul? Somebody wiser than I has, has said something to the effect that if you begin wrong, you're bound to wind up wrong. Now, it strikes me that if you begin wrong because of her, her ideas about authority are coming up. That is to say, revelatory authority, what we would view as a scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, she would argue, though, that she does have a good theology, revelatory theology. The Bible is the insp She's mentioned that in a couple of these interviews, the Bible is the inspiration. The um, Bible is inspired. She isn't. She states that. But what else is it? I mean, she's getting some revelation from God, new messages, she calls them, um, directly from God. Right. That has to be gummed up by definition. Yep. But she she thinks it's okay. That's the danger of it. Not the only danger, but one of the dangers. Yeah. Terry. Start chanting and 
things over and over and over again. You get on, you get on this spiritual high, mm -hmm. and it makes you feel really good. And the same thing, if you're in a, in a zone where you're thinking you're really connecting with God, uh, it gives you kind of a euphoric feeling. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. <coughs> Just like the shack. And I'd like to know what she did with the twenty million with the money. And and also it sounds like that she uses the name of Jesus to profit by inserting that in every book mm -hmm. that yep. she's using the name of Jesus to uh, Yeah. Even if she made a dollar a book, which is probably more than that, they sell for you know, 12 or 15, 15 .99. probably at least a couple of dollars a book, so she's, and there's tons of stuff too, I mean there's sure, there's all sorts of, of paraphernalia that you can buy as well, Jesus calling stuff, calendars or whatever, Bible and uh, yes, Bible covers, yep, yep, get a tie for Christmas, Jesus calling tie, um, so she's a multi, multi-millionaire, and uh, Remember what Charles Spurgeon did with his money? And he, he would have been a multi, multi millionaire in those days, maybe not millionaires, but he bought books for pastors. He started orphan. I mean, he, he gave away almost all of his money. That he, I mean, he lived on the salary of the church, but books and stuff like that, he used that as a message, poured it right back into the ministry, different, different things. And uh, it's a different world. Not too many Spurgeons around, fortunately. Anything else? Okay. All right. Always stand. We'll be dismissed with prayer.